They tell of the landlord of the shtetl, the little towns in other countries of long ago that had this drunkard party and gambled his money and lost most of his property. And of course, the solution was the Jews. He calls his men. He says, go to the shtetl, tell the Jews I need 20,000 rubles within a week or they'll be evacuated. He goes back to him and then the servant comes back and said, how did they respond? They started crying and begging and he said, take, take from them, take from them. After a month, again, he goes on this leisure, this cruise. Once again, he has no money, he calls his guy. He says, listen, go to the shtetl, tell the Jews there I want 40,000 rubles within a week or they will be evacuated and chased out. He comes back to his master, says, what did, how did they react? They cried, they begged, and the landlord says, take from them, take from them. After his mother has to marry his daughter, and he has no money because he spent it all. He calls his guy again, says, go to the shtetl, go to the Jews, get more money. He comes back, someone comes back, he says, they started giggling. And uh, they, they, say, they said, no, I, we don't have any, any anymore. And if the Jews reacted that he understood that there really is nothing where they went over line, I think this actually reflects the reality that has been created here. Because on the one hand side, um, there is construction and building in many areas, uh, settlement uh, has developed, and despite all the freezing, we are number one as far as growth, 10%. I mean, in Judea and Samaria, the national average is 1.78. Uh, despite all the penalties and the persecutions, on the other hand, there are 400,000 people here who are persecuted in many ways, and they are always have to come across different barriers and walls, you know, ostensibly legal ones. An example, in the past weekend, Zef Elkin is here, who did much in the matter, and we do have to give him praise for that. We merited to hear that proclamation there will be a university in Ariel, and the Prime Minister really declared there's a first university in Shomron in Samaria. But what we did not remember is that the, um, the government took this decision a half a year ago. There was a government resolution that there is a university, but there was no university. My sister was about to um, to finish her degree, they will get a degree of a college, not of a university. Why? Because the uh, military commander did not sign the paper. I mean, this is crazy. It's not real. We don't find such things anywhere in the world. Maybe, in, you know, some old regimes that used to be here in Israel very, very long ago. By the way, the commander did not, did not sign, not because he didn't want to, but there was a politician, the Minister of Defense, who didn't want to sign. We have different settlements in the Shomor and Syria, like Rechilim, for example, a place where, again, the first in the government decided to recognize the place as a settlement. The first Barak government built houses, and they, they're just missing a signature on the planet. And from 2000, Dr. Talia Sasson, nothing can be moved, not a single stone can be moved, because there is always is an injunction to demolish things, just to build anything. Also, Habrachad, again, the, 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 there is a, a plan to build there, an open area, the Mayan and Kfir, and um, in other places, Khalim and Bracha. Again, people that bought from Amidar, um, just like in other places, can Amidar, which is, again, a company belonging to the Ministry of um, Housing, Nothing can be done, and, and then we cannot, of course, put a stop to the birth rate. But after, after a year of struggling and f trying to find a different solution, and uh, the, actually for a whole year, the, the, there was not enough space, and the kindergarten kids had to study in a room in the community center. Um, different places as well, Bruchim, another place. Again, the end of the 90s, it was founded. And again, Minister of House, uh, Housing built homes there. Families bought homes. One signature was missing on the um, plans. And four years ago, in the winter, it was a very difficult winter, by the way, a mother went out with a child because the electricity fell. And they had to get permission from the Ministry of Defense to put some sort of cable. And again, there was no power in the entire Yeshuv in the settlement in homes that the people bought from the government. Again, a mother goes out with a baby to the car and puts on the heating because there was no heating in the home. Where's the father? The father was within the army. 
in some sort of a draw. The next day, the Minister of, of Barak, uh, Minister of Defense Barak has said, um, I really, uh, he actually went up to that drill, to the military drill up north where that father was, and he praised it. And then the father, that commander, said, by the way, you know, yesterday my wife had to go out into the car with a baby. I'm doing Miloim right now. I'm in a military drill, but my wife is freezing because there's no signature. Do you think it helped him? It didn't help him at all. And even if it did, let's just say it did. Why in the state of Israel, in the year 2000, in a settlement established by the state of Israel, why does a minister of defense, we have to, he has to be in a good mood for a, a mother to have electricity in a home so that the mother won't have to go into the car at midnight, so that the baby won't freeze to death. Unbelievable. Only in the Shamron Regional Council, which is uh, one out of the 23, part of one out of 23rd of all the councils in the state of Israel, we have 100, it's again, it's one part of 23, it's one of the biggest ones, but there are 100 such, you know, uh, such um, documents that are waiting for the signature. We have thick files, such thick files, and again, I'm talking about planning, urban plans. When one establishes a, a settlement, there's an initial plan, and then there is an urban building plan, the UBP, the Taba in Hebrew, where the next neighborhood will be. And it takes many, many years. I can remind Bet Shemesh also doesn't have a signature over these plans because of procedural processes. By the way, Bet Shemesh was actually established in 1951, and that, that Taba, that UBP, was in 1991. And since the Talia Sasson report, where there is no UBP, it's almost like a basic law. It's like there is a vacuum there. So we have such thick files, all these applications to the Ministry of Defense about, you know, the, the uh, urban plans. And I don't even know, I actually remember this off far, but on the, his table, and you know, the, the, this, we get the usual response. It is on his table, and his response will come in due date. You know, imagine in Rabat Ben Shemesh that, um, that they simply get this response. It will be um, discussed um, in due course. Could you imagine 360,000 people are waiting for such a response? This is a reality in which people are, are living. And again, before the security situation, the political situation, the municipal problems and budgets and opposition, whatever it is, this is like a little basic thing of we have to deal with this response. It will be discussed in due course or response will be given in due course. There was once a, a mayor that came to me and I actually took him on a tour in the Shomron in Samaria. At a certain point, he actually stopped us. It somebody was in the no, you said him on Nofim, again, in existence for 30 years, and it has no signature over the urban plan, by the way. And again, thanks to the plan, again, I would like to praise the EV, together with other people, other ministries, invested a lot in finding solutions to this problem. So Nofim, again, the UPP is about to be signed. But again, I told this guy, this mayor, this foreign mayor, um, that uh, been, we've been waiting for a signature. And he said to me, look, you sound um, very nice to me, but are you sure you're telling me the truth? And I said, of course I'm telling you the truth. And he said, it's not, you know, not logical. I was a mayor for 10 years. What does it mean it will be discussed in due course? I don't understand this response. You know? So he started, he actually called up um, and do you think do you think anyone responded? I don't know, it didn't help. But then some sort of constellation was created. Some people at the end of the day were able to cause a, the minister, the prime minister who convinced the minister of defense to sign. Every so often, people in Judea and Samaria get some sort of injunction that they have to remove themselves from a certain area. Some, you know, as if they are these big criminals, you know, they're actually these criminal families, people who have actually murdered people, people who actually shot missiles at homes in Netanyahu, people who explode um, cars on highways in Tel Aviv. They did not get any um, injunction, um, you know, to keep away or not being allowed to enter certain areas. Uh, could you imagine? But we have to deal with this response of will be discussed in due course. Now imagine. Judea and Samaria, no difference from the Golan height. And again, you know, the, the, we do know that the laws, you know, are, are imposed. I mean, we had to go to the army. Um, we are um, bound by all traffic laws, etc. Of course, this is just this, this rubber seal of approval. Um, you, and we cannot say such a thing, you know, you're a bad. Uh, leader or it's a bad regional council. This is, it's not real. Could you imagine that um, the commander, military commander is not signing a certain order after the government has taken a decision that a university will be established for, um, will be established. 
Ms. Peter, another example. If at Asaf, why does it want to be evacuated? They have some sort of an administrative document that from this area, this uh, this area is just a vacuum, and it's written in this injunction that it only applies um, on Jews and not on Arabs. And again, the whole trick here is that it's only for Jews and not for Arabs. It's unbelievable. Again, there are stories of Jewish farmers who have lost investments in Kedumim, in Har Hebron, in Benjamin. Why? Why? Because an Arab came and said that this belongs to him. You know, every place has its court. There is a Shalom court. There's a district court. And, uh, you know, I could just say this is mine and that's the end of the day. Uh, you know, uh, somebody comes, says this is mine and then and that's the end of the story for the Jew. You know, clocks um, in the in the military court suddenly decided to create this whole issue, and everyone is trying to actually deal with a little injunction that was formed by a little um, lady, a soldier in the military court. So this is unreal. Again, I don't want to create pessimism. On the one hand, we have a very happy crowd here, and 95% of the residents of Judea and Samaria are happy. On the other hand, there are second grade citizens, as for legally speaking and otherwise. But again, the, the state has never decided so. If somebody had actually taken a positive decision that we are second grade citizens, okay, maybe we could actually deal with it. We know what our sages said. Meaning, um, uh, actually a justice of the High Court of Justice, I took her on a tour to in Samaria and she actually said to me in this very heavy Yakish accent, and she said, when was it Talia Sasson report? 2004, I answered. And she says to me, what year is it now? It was half a year ago. I said to her, 2012. Uh, how many governments have we had since then? And you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not you, it's the government, she understood. So it's very easy for the Minister of Defense to hide by the government. It is the State of Israel at the end of the day, and the State of Israel has even decided that it will be our second great citizen. But the minute the, that there is a hole, then, as our sage just said, as I mentioned before, the rats come in wherever there is a hole. I was asked to talk about the situation in reality in the field. Of course, it affects the internal situation as well. For 20 years, we have to deal with the international arena, our hold over Judea and Samaria. We know it, there is reciprocal um, connections here. We know that oftentimes the way we act in the field the, um, affects the different administration processes, things that are happening in Itamar, for example, because people are scared. Oftentimes, people who sit in the offices, things affect the awareness, while we, while in our generals say, keep saying these are security interests and all those our politicians with ties say abroad that they are partners and so forth, but they say one thing, it is ours. So of course, the world will never be with us and of course it will have a bad impact. And let me tell you a story of something that happened half a year ago. Um, in the European Parliament, our head, Gersha Masika actually talked there in the Foreign Committee. And he talks about the Bible and he talks about Clause 87 in the UN Convention about protecting our right over the land. And that's something that cannot be uh, appealed, something that is inalienable right. And then he's, at the end only he spoke about matters of security and people applauded him. And after it was over, two nice people came up to him, two young people. One came up and said, I'm a representative of the Jewish embassy in the EU. And the other one said, I am a, a representative of the pro-Israeli lobby in the EU. And they said, good for you. This is the first time a conference like this. And the second thing they said is, you won't succeed here. Why? I asked, because you don't speak European. And I said, you'll never succeed here because you do speak European. You accept their narrative. And then, uh, you know, you say if there's no partner, then they'll find you a partner. Salim Fiat, he wears a nice suit and everything or whatever. And uh, I'd like to conclude with this. A very senior 
Chinese uh, journalist, uh, what is a senior Chinese journalist, he has maybe 300 million readers, and he came to Samaria to visit, and at the end he said, okay, I understand, he said, but what are you doing here? This is occupied land, you have to go away from here. So his escort uh, uh, said to him, haven't you ever heard of the Bible? And he, you know, the Chinese don't know the Bible so well. I said, you know, there's this book. I know, he said, there is a Bible, and then he told him about God who created the created the world and that he gave the land to Abraham, Isaac and, and Jacob and then he looked at him and he said, you know what? I thank you very much for that. I've been here for six years and nobody's ever said that to me. And I wanted to weep when I heard that. It sounds funny, but he's been here for six years and I assume that he's met spokespeople and ministers and all kinds of senior people and everybody talks about security and security and no partner and all that, which is all true. But nobody told him the most basic thing. And as I said earlier, we're to blame. It's we're to blame for this. And I tried to give you a very brief review. There is a situation, you know, as it says in, that in Egypt, the more they persecuted them, the more they grew. But there's one thing that the, st the government has to do to say clearly that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people and that's why we're going to apply sovereignty. And that is the only way that we will triumph in the international leader. Think about, you know, North and South Korea. We hear about it and it goes right by us. But what we hear, our only way to win in the Hasbara war is to say that and to say clearly that, the, that it, and there's only one way to show it, as the organizer said, to apply sovereignty over Judea and Samaria.